Today we are going to be investigating the flow of matter and energy and ecosystems. You will be in your life science review packet and you will be on page three. So let's first determine what is a food web? A food web is a model that depicts several food chains linked together. So a chain would just be looking at one part of a food web, like maybe something like uh, you have the sun, the sun provides energy to plants, plants, that plant then produces energy that a bunny eats, and then a fox eats that bunny. Now this is just one food chain, which would be part of a much larger web. If you were to look at a food web, you'd be looking at how a rabbit, squirrel, mice, and uh, seed-eating birds all eat these plants, and a fox eats all of those animals. It becomes a little bit more complex. Here would be an example of how energy moves through just a chain, just one part of that food web. Do you notice something? Look at the amount of energy that's provided at each of these levels. Do you see that the producers here produce 10,000 kilocalories of energy? And then when the bunny eats the producer's food, now the bunny has 1,000 kilocalories of energy. And the snake who eats the bunny has 100 kilocalories. And then the eagle that eats the snake has 10 kilocalories. Do you notice that each consumer, there ends up being energy lost. Where does that energy go? It's lost in the form of heat. So where does all the energy come from? Look at this food chain and see if you can figure it out. All energy originates from the sun. Make sure you write in your note-taking packet that all energy originates from the sun. Now let's talk about each of these things, like the plants or the uh, animal that eats the plants. Here we are talking about producers, consumers, and decomposers. Remember that producers are things that actually create their own energy. How do they do this? They do this with the process of photosynthesis. They take chemical energy, they take light energy from the sun and convert it into chemical energy, which would be food. Consumers are then the animals that cannot make their own food. They cannot convert energy from the sun and make it into food or chemical energy. So they must consume other things in order to get their energy, like plants and or animals. And then there's decomposers. Decomposers are the things that actually break down dead plants and animals, therefore release, releasing the nutrients back into the soil. Hence the circle of life. Now put it all together. Do you see those three questions on the bottom of your note-taking sheet? I would like you to answer these. Compare and contrast the roles of consumers, producers, and decomposers in our ecosystem. Go ahead and write how they are similar and different. Also, make certain how you talk about how all of the groups are interrelated and how they depend upon one another. And why do you think producers are so important to us? Go ahead and write your answers in the space provided. When you are done, turn your paper over. Let's look at producers a little bit more. When we talk about producers, we say that producers produce their own energy. How do they do this? Through photosynthesis. You can see how sunlight goes in. The plant will then take in sunlight and carbon dioxide from the air and the water and the soil along with other nutrients and they will convert this into their own energy. The byproduct is glucose, sugar, and oxygen. Let's look at consumers. Remember, consumers are the animals that eat other things for energy. So you can have things like herbivores, and herbivores actually need to eat plants to get energy. Carnivores, carnivores will only eat other animals to get energy. And omnivores, like us, we eat both plants and animals to obtain energy. And now let's look at decomposers. Examples of things that are decomposers are things like fungi and bacteria. I hope this helps you answer the three questions on the bottom of your note-taking sheet. Now let's look at examples of things like producers, consumers, and decomposers. What do you think a cat would be? It is a consumer. What about grass? It is a producer. 
a cow, mushrooms, a flower, a house plant, fungi. A human. You get the idea. Now let's look at food chains. Put these in order. You would start with a producer, a primary consumer, and a secondary consumer. Let's try something a little bit more complex. You would start with a producer, a primary consumer, secondary consumer, and tertiary consumer. Now that we've looked at the things within a food chain, let's look at where these food chains are living, and that would be ecosystems. Let's first look at the ecosystems that deal with water. Let's first start with a freshwater ecosystem. Freshwater ecosystems are ecosystems that include streams, rivers, ponds, and lakes. Make sure you write down examples of freshwater ecosystems on your note-taking sheet. Let's also look at a marine or saltwater ecosystem. This would be things like estuaries. Make sure you write estuaries down on your note-taking sheet. So this is where you have things like freshwater or rivers meeting up with an ocean. So you have freshwater meeting up with saltwater. And then a non-water ecosystem. This would be the ecosystem that we, we live in, and this is a prairie ecosystem. A prairie ecosystem deals with grasses. Think of Nebraska. We have a lot of grassland, and that's great because we have livestock like cows that graze on these grasses, these wheats and grains. Now, let's look at other parts of an ecosystem. When we look at an ecosystem, an ecosystem is made out of uh, four different things. Let's first start with the smallest part, an organism. Make sure you define organism in your note-taking packet. I actually want you to draw an arrow between the triangle that you see in your note-taking packet. Write organism and define it. An organism is a living thing that needs certain things to live and grow and reproduce. When you have multiple organisms that come together, well now we have a population. And a population is all members of one species living in a particular area. So a population, you could have like a population of deer or a population of rabbits or a population of people. But notice that it's always one species living in a specific area. If you want to talk about multiple species coming together, well, then you're talking about a community. And a community is when you have multiple populations of different species coming together and living in an environment. And then the last big picture is an ecosystem. And an ecosystem is where you're looking at not only the community, all the living things that are in that environment, but you're also looking at the non-living. An ecosystem is looking at both living and non-living things. We will talk more about these living and non-living things later. Make sure you've written down all four of these definitions in your note-taking sheet. Remember, this is a pyramid of an ecosystem. Think of it a lot like when we talked about human body systems and we talked about how cells make up tissue and tissue makes up organs and organs make up organ systems. It's the same thing. An organism builds into a population when you have multiple populations, you have a community. And when you have a community living with non-living things, you have an ecosystem. Let's look at one last aspect of an ecosystem. Let's look at ocean zones. When you look at your ocean, you can have four different zones. You can have what's called the intertidal zone. And the intertidal zone is located between where you are gonna have your highest high tide and your lowest low tide. The nerdic zone is a region where the water is shallow, and this is the low tide land, um, line extending all the way over to the continental sh um, shelf. And then you have the surface zone, which would be the open ocean beyond the nerdic zone, and it extends to about 200 meters in depth. 
which then brings you to the deep zone. And the deep zone is everything beyond that. So that we're talking about the very bottom surface of our ocean floor. On a trip to the beach, what are some things you would expect to see in each of these zones? In our title, Nerdic, surface zone. Go ahead and write down all four definitions for the different types of ocean zones and answer the question about what types of things you would expect to see at each of these zones on your note-taking sheet. And then when you're done, go ahead and flip your note-taking sheet over because it has finally come time for us to talk about this idea that an ecosystem is made out of living and non-living things. When we talk about living things, what we're talking about are biotic factors. Remember, bio is talking about life. So when we're looking at biotic factors, we're looking at things that are living. So what are the things that you can see that are living in this picture below? If you identify things like trees or grasses, those would all be things that are biotic factors. Make sure you list at least three examples of things that are biotic on your note-taking sheet. You can, of course, list things that are not in this picture, like different types of animals or people. Now let's look at abiotic factors. Abiotic factors are things that are not living in an ecosystem. So abiotic factors would be, well, the fact that we have a river or that there's wind and rain or the amount of sunlight. Abiotic factors are things that are not living, but yet they affect the ecosystem. So the amount of moisture that is in the air or in the soil, the type of weather that we have, if we have rocky terrain or sandy terrain, those types of things are considered abiotic factors. When we look at an ecosystem, we not only take into account the things that are living and not living, but we also take into account the carrying capacity of that ecosystem. How many animals can actually live in this region successfully? This is carrying capacity. Go ahead and define carrying capacity in your note-taking sheet. So carrying capacity is looking at the population that can be supported in that ecosystem without actually destroying the ecosystem itself. How do you think humans have been doing when it comes to carrying capacity? So let's look at population in more detail. So we learned earlier that an organism, it would be a living thing like an animal and that if you have multiple types of that animal coming together, that this is a population. So a population is where you have multiple individuals of the exact same species living together in a similar space at a similar time. So this would be like a population of butterflies or a population of deer or humans. And when we talk about populations, these populations do not live in seclusion. Populations oftentimes interact with other populations of animals. And this is where we have symbiotic relationships forming. What is a symbiotic relationship? A symbiotic relationship is just talking about the association between different organisms. So what you're looking at is, do these organisms benefit each other? Or do they just live interdependent of each other? An example of an organism benefiting would be communalism. Communalism is where you have two different species coming together, two different populations, and one species is actually benefiting from another. So with communalism, you can see here that the birds are actually benefiting from living on top of the cattle because the birds can actually obtain insects or food from the cattle. The cattle are not harmed, but they are also not benefiting from this relationship. Mutualism, mutualism is where both organisms are equally benefiting from the association of the two population, populations living together, like the fact that clownfish can hide from predators inside a sea and an enemy, and the clownfish scares away the butterfly fish, which actually normally eat sea and anemones. And then there's the last form of a relationship, which would be parasiticism. And this is a relationship between two organisms in which one species, the parasite, is actually benefiting at the expense of the other species, like the host. And an example of this would be like fleas biting on your dog's skin. The fleas receive food while the dog receives pain.